Hello, and welcome to our next lecture in Research Methods in Psychology. Today we're going to be talking about uh, within subjects designs, continuing our discussion of experimental methods. In the previous two lectures, we talked about experimental designs and cons uh, confounds and experimental control. Today we'll specifically be talking about uh, within subjects designs. I'll first introduce exactly what they are. Talk about some issues with order effects and within subjects designs we don't see in between subjects designs. Talk about order counterbalancing and uh, in particular methods for order counterbalancing, block counterbalancing, Latin squares designs, all possible orders, etc. Briefly, sort of run through uh, a summary of the costs and benefits of doing within subjects designs, and then finally, I want to briefly discuss uh, what statistics we use in these repeated measures designs. So to start off. Uh, when we talk about a within subjects design, we're talking about a what we would really classify as a fully within subjects design, where all subjects participate in all levels of the experiment. So for the entire experiment, we have one group of participants who are participated in the entire experiment. We often refer to this as a repeated measures design because we repeatedly measure the same subjects. So um, because we're taking more than one measurement from each participant, we're repeatedly measuring their performance on different tasks or across different independent variables or different levels of the same independent variable. But in this within participants design or within subjects design, we are repeatedly measuring the same group of people. Uh, this has a, a pretty distinct advantage over between subjects designs because it eliminates individual differences as a confound. That is, there can't be any differences between our groups because we only have one group. Now, we do have to think carefully about how we structure a repeated measures design. So if we're repeatedly measuring people across a longer period of time, so for instance, in some of my research, we will have... Um, tested people a week apart, uh, once in a placebo condition, once in a drug condition, or once when they're smoking regularly or abstaining from smoking. And in other research, we're testing people eight weeks apart. And so we have to carefully think about uh, some potential differences in those individuals across those time frames. In particular, for example, if we are talking about um, younger adult women, uh, we would be concerned about whether or not we have systematic variance in menstrual cycle uh, for those participants because we're testing them at different portions potentially of their menstrual cycle. Gets very complicated out there in the real world, but we have to think very carefully about how we structure this kind of research. But in general, we can eliminate individual differences as a confound. Now, one of the biggest problems we have in within subjects designs are order effects because we're repeatedly measuring people. We have to be very careful about what order in which we might measure participants. So the first issue we have are practice effects. Practice effects occur because subjects just simply get better at a task after repeatedly engaging in that task. So they've practiced at it, so they're going to get better at it. And really depends on the um, task itself, people tend to not get much better at episodic memory tasks, for example, because their memory is their memory. But if it's something that's a little bit more skill-based, like sequence learning or mental rotation, they will definitely get better as they have more practice with that kind of task. So you have to think very carefully about how you might order your independent variable. So for example, there is a uh, phenomenon known as the Mozart effect. And if you play Mozart prior to participants um, engaging in a mental rotation task, they get better. Well, in that instance, you have to be very careful how you order your um, experiment. So in that case, we would counterbalance, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, the order of whether or not they get Mozart or they sit quietly for a few minutes or maybe some other kind of music, depending on how we set up the experiment. But we would want Mozart to occur first in the order effects in, for half the participants and second for the other half of the participants so that we have counterbalanced the effect or the potential effect of that practice on that kind of task. Similarly, we can have carryover effects. Carryover effects can be positive or negative. So a practice effect is where people are getting better. Um, but a carryover effect is when performance on one task can benefit or inhibit performance on a subsequent task. So it might be these are two different tasks. So in fact, the Mozart effect is actually what we would call a carryover effect. That is that listening to Mozart has carryovered 
to that mental rotation task. And so we would call that a carryover effect. Um, this can occur between two different tasks um, simply because of uh, the way in which uh, we might end up with some sort of semantic priming or we might end up with people that are getting better at numbers but that, that interferes with something else. And so we have to think very carefully about how we might get these kind of carryover effects. In an extreme example, some of my research involved um, pharmacologically induced amnesia or drug-induced amnesia using a drug called midazolam or Versed. And so our participants came in twice and received an injection either of midazolam or of saline placebo. Those participants that received midazolam in that first session, that is, that drug-induced amnesia, in the second session, they were much more likely to rate their memory as being worse than participants who had saline in the per first um, session. So that kind of carryover effect uh, is an important thing to think about, and again, that's why we counterbalance. Fatigue effects are sort of the backwards part of a practice effects. Depending on how long an experiment is, participants will just get tired of being in it. If particularly it's a lot of trials of the same thing over and over and over again, people get pretty tired of it. Um, and so they get fatigued, they don't pay as much attention, they're not putting as much effort. Um, so we have to be very cautious uh, with that as well. So their attention might wander. Uh, so we don't want performance on that sort of last task in the experiment to suffer simply because it's last. So again, we counterbalance for order. And so what we're doing when we counterbalance is we're trying to, rant, we're trying to distribute those effects evenly. So practice effects are distributed evenly across conditions. Fatigue effects are, uh, are um, evenly distributed across conditions as well. So that's what we have with order effects. When the order of our the levels of our independent variable or of different tasks, depending on the kind of experiment we might have, uh, is going to have an influence over our result. So that gets us then to order counterbalancing. And here what we're going to do is we're going to counterbalance the effect of those um, different levels of an independent variable. So we're going to start with block randomization and ABBA counterbalancing. And these are usually instances where we have a lot of repeats of the same kind of trial. And usually, say we might have a list of items, and we want to make sure we counterbalance the order in which those items are appearing in a list, in a long list. Uh, same with ABBA counterbalancing. Uh, then we'll talk about all possible orders in Latin squares. And these are usually when we have uh, a condition occurring, um, each condition only occurring once in an experiment. So let's start with block randomization. So this procedure is used whenever we have a large number of repeated occurrences of an experimental condition. So for example, if we were going to direct people to uh, study items uh, based on their structure, that is, is it upper or lower case letters? Uh, whether based on its acoustic sound, that is, does it rhyme with another word? Uh, based on semantics, does it fit into a sentence? Uh, and self-reference, does this word apply to you? So these would be four different ways in which we might get people to encode individual words. So is it upper or lowercase letters? Does it sound like a rhyme with this word? Does it fit into this sentence? Or does it apply to you? And that would be that self-reference. So these would be four different encoding conditions. Well, we might have then 25 of each of these, so 100 words altogether, to see which one might be the best way for us to remember. So what we could do then is we can assign sort of letters, sort of makes it a little easier, to structural, acoustic, semantic, and self-referential processing. And then what we can do is sort of randomize within each block. So each chunk of these four different types of encoding will occur together. There will always be four of them together. But what order they occur within that block will be randomized. So I've just pseudo-randomized these. You can do this with a computer. It's pretty easy. But, you know, here we have A, B, D, C, B, A, C, D. So each one of these individual conditions is occurring within a block. So each block will contain n number of trials, where n is the number of conditions. So we have four levels of our independent variable. So we have four trials within an individual block. So we'll create then k blocks. This will be the number of times each condition is completed. So in the example I was just using, we would create 25 of these blocks across our 100 uh, item experiment. Uh, 
So four of each, four self, oh, sorry, 25 self-reference, 25 semantic, 25 acoustic, 25 structural. But we're going to block randomize those so that we don't end up with 10 structural randomly at the beginning and then six self-reference all the way at the end. We've evenly distributed these trials across that 100 item list so that the first four items include one of each condition and the last four items include one of each condition. So the idea here is, of course, to distribute the effects across that list so that we make sure uh, that we don't have practice effects or fatigue effects for any of one of these four conditions. So that order of conditions is randomized within each block and then we'll have 25 blocks each with the four different conditions. So we will, each block will contain um, each level of our independent variable and then we will create however many blocks for the number of times we repeat each condition. Okay, so that then gets us to uh, ABBA counterbalancing. It's not ABBA counterbalancing. It actually stands for ABBA. It's very similar to block counterbalancing, but with only two conditions. So what we do then is this allows for no more than uh, two conditions of the same instance in a row. So we'll go ABBA, ABBA, ABBA. Pretty simple. Uh, the idea is, again, so that A always comes before B, B always comes before A, and it always does so in the same number of instances. So we can distribute any practice or fatigue effects across the experiment. Pretty straightforward and simple. Now, that gets us to order uh, all possible orders counterbalancing. This is um, with a small number of uh, independent variable levels or conditions or independent variables, depending on how we might be doing this. Uh, it's doable. So for example, if we have three conditions or three tasks within an experiment, um, we can do this with six uh, all possible orders counterbalancing. So we get a complete counterbalancing every six participants. So you can see here at the bottom we have ABC, ACB, BAC, BCA, CBA, and CAB. Every possible order is within that, within that counterbalancing. When we get to four, we can still do it. We can still do that 24 participants. That's not unreasonable to do an all possible order counterbalancing. Once we get to five, six, seven, or eight, we have now gone beyond the realm of the possible. So we can't run 40,000 subjects to get all of our counterbalancing. So we have to do something different. And the idea here is we want to make sure we are distributing any kind of carryover effects, practice effects, and fatigue effects equally across the experiment. So to do that, beyond three or four um, conditions, we go to a Latin squares. Um, I actually found this really nice color representation of what a Latin squares counterbalancing looks like. So the goal here is to ensure each condition comes before and after every other condition. So here we can see red comes before orange, here orange comes before red, you know. So red comes before all these conditions, here blue comes before all these conditions. Uh, you can pretty graphically see that we have uh, managed to counterbalance any potential fatigue effects, practice effects, or carryover effects across the entire experiment. So formally, a Latin squares design is an array where each condition occurs exactly once in each row and once in each column. Now, we're going to have to get into... Uh, and we're going to gloss over some of the math involved. Uh, this is actually an incomplete Latin square. So it's actually a reduced form of a Latin square because it has an odd number of conditions. What we would do in uh, the instance of an odd number of conditions, we would create a second array in which we start with that first row, but we reverse its, its order. Well, we'll get into that here in just a sec. So um, here's how we construct a Latin square. Easiest thing to do is to think of this with numbers. We assign each condition a number. We start with the initial order, one, two, three, four. Then we just add one to each. And then whenever we get to n plus one, so n is our number of conditions, um, that will equal one. So when we get to four plus one, that becomes a one. So here we have one plus one becomes two, two becomes three, three becomes four, four becomes one. And you can see we then have an array in which this occurs once in each row and we end up with a number of once in each row. Now, to do this completely, uh, we are going to do the same thing with an odd number. We start one, two, three, four, five, and then we have 
and a 23451, 34512, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But with an odd number of conditions, to make sure that we have truly evenly distributed counter or um, carryover effects, practice effects, and fatigue effects, we're going to construct a second Latin square where we take the first row and reverse it. We're going to flop down. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to make a bad joke there. Um, flip down and reverse it. So we're going to do this five, four, three, two, one. And then we do the same thing we did before where we add one to each of these. And when we add uh, one to five, we go back to one again. And so we have uh, everything distributed evenly again. So with an odd number, you're supposed to construct two Latin squares. So it would actually take 10 participants to get a complete counterbalancing for uh, uh, an experiment with five conditions. So that's constructing a Latin square. I want to run through some pros and cons of uh, within subject designs. We'll start with the benefits. Fewer participants are needed because we're doing everything within subjects, whereas when you do between subjects, you need a number of people in each condition. And we'll talk about that in the next lecture. Solves the problem of individual differences. We've got one group of people, so we don't have to worry about if there's more males or females, or people are more educated or less educated, or um, what they had for breakfast. And finally, we get better statistical power out of within subjects designs, and that's because we're able to account for the variance, um, the shared variance between measurements that is associated with the individuals. We'll get into that here in a sec. Problems with within subjects designs, basically we have to think about practice effects, carryover effects, fatigue effects, and then finally we have this problem of differential transfer. And this occurs when we can't, something about one condition will poison or make it impossible for the next condition to be run the same way. So, for example, if we are using um, a, an incidental learning paradigm where we haven't told individuals that they are in a memory test, um, so we're going to do intentional versus incidental learning, that is a problem of differential transfer because in one case, they're going to learn incidentally. We're not going to tell them they're in a memory test. And then in another condition, we're going to tell them they're in a memory test. Well, we can't counterbalance that. And so that's tough to do with, within subjects designs. Uh, other times, you really can't transfer um, from one condition to the other. So for example, in the smoking cessation literature, we can't transfer someone from one smoking cessation attempt to another because essentially, we want people to quit smoking and they can only quit if they're going to quit they're going to quit or they're not going to quit um, and so we can't do those as within subjects designs so that gets us to repeated measures so repeated measure statistics tend to have greater power because they can account for the shared variance between the two measures depending on the statistic involved um, but paired samples t-tests and matched samples t-tests or dependent samples t-tests whichever name you want to give it um, has that increased statistical power because you are subtracting out the covariance of those two groups. Um, so for a single independent variable with two levels, we're going to use a paired samples or sometimes called dependent samples, sometimes it's called match samples t-test. Fairly simple, fairly easy to do. Uh, for a single independent variable with three or more levels, or for multiple within subjects independent variables, we'll use a repeated measures analysis of variance. And so uh, these have a little bit more statistical power than their um, between subjects counterparts. All right, that's our introduction to within subjects designs. Next up will be a discussion of between subjects designs.